Happy New Year and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, Happy New Year, everyone, and I want to thank you so much for watching my show. You know, today I start my fifth year of broadcasting at least one show live every day, and as my special gift to, to you, I have a Chef AJ Marathon. We will have 14 hours of continuous programming today, starting with a very special guest to kick your New Year's off right, to inspire you and motivate you to make changes and continue on your journey of health, healing, and weight loss. We will have 12 guests from all over the world, all different walks of life, all vegan though. And we will be starting off with none other than Dr. John McDougall. Please welcome him to the show. Dr. McDougall, this is not the first time that we have coordinated colors without even talking to each other. Yeah. Well, we must be like minds in the universe, AJ. And these are <laughs> no. all live shows you're going to do today? Some of them, Dr. McDougall, I, I do like to take time to eat and sleep, so I had to pre-record. Oh, so, oh, some of it. Okay, well, I'm glad we can start with a live <laughs> show, and, and I'm honored that you uh, started the new year with me. Well, who what better? Because, you know, you always talk about making the change, and if not now, when, right? Yeah, well, you know, the forces have never been greater. Yeah. You know, Dr. McDougall, you, you've seen you've thousands of patients, thousands of success stories on your website, US Star McDougallers, and I have only worked with a fraction of the people that you have. But one thing I often hear is I'm too old. It's too hard to do it at my age. I can't lose weight. Yeah. If you don't mind, I would like to bring on a lovely lady who I just met last week who came on my show, who at the age of in her 60s on 17 medications was told to read The Starch Solution by Linda Middlesworth, and she would like to thank you. Is that all right, Dr. McDougall? Oh, yeah, no, I, listen, I, oh, those are the kind of things I thrive off of. I've said so many times, uh, the real gift in life is helping other people. You know, that's where you get your rewards. And so right. since I haven't been able to change the world, and I've tried, I've gotten my satisfaction out of each and every each and every individual I've been able to, to touch and help. And along when I say I, I mean the team because it has been a team effort, as you well know. What's amazing is it's, you know, obviously the people that take the McDougal program and you have another one starting this month have tremendous success. But just simply by reading your book, she was able to accomplish this. Please welcome yeah. back to the show, Margie Burton and her sister, Helen. Yeah, isn't that amazing? We give it away free. <laughs> so Margie, here's your chance to meet Dr. McDougal. Dr. Oh, yeah. McDougal, I am so humbled. In fact, it's almost bringing tears to my eyes because you changed my life so dramatically and you don't even know me. And I think there are thousands of us out there. And I just to, wanted to represent some of those thousands and just thank you. Thank you. Well, you, you got to tell me a little bit about yeah. what happened. Well, um, eight years ago, I knew that I was going to be changing my medication scheme in a year. So I started at, at age 64 and I thought I'm going to get healthy. So what did I do? I go join a gym. And that's where I met a very fit 71-year-old who was leading us through uh, exercises. And she said, you know, it's great that you're here to get stronger, but this is not going to help you if you're here to lose weight. And I perked up at that because that's why I was there. I'd had a weight issue my entire life. And I thought I wanted to get healthy. And so she said, see me after class. And so I couldn't wait for class to end fast enough before I ran up to her said, what do I need to do? And she said, you need to do two things. One is to watch Forks Over Knives, the video on Netflix. I said, I can do that. She said, the other thing you need to do is order the starch solution by Dr. John McDougall. And so that's what I did. It came the next day and I just voraciously read it. I thought I never heard any of these things before. And it just touched me so much that that very day I vowed to follow your eating plan, which was basically to eliminate all animal products. And so I, I just pledged to myself that that's what I was going to do. And I live with oh, my husband yeah. and my older sister who is sitting here with me. Um, my sister oh. Ellen is developmentally disabled and um, she's uh, autistic as well. And she lives with us. And she wasn't real happy about changing. So I fixed two meals, meals for my husband and my sister and meals for myself. And that after a month or so, my husband said, you know, we'll just eat the way you eat. Oh. And my sister was uh, a little upset about it. She went to her doctor and she was crying. 
and said, why do I need to do this? And he, he turned to me and he said, what are you making her eat? And I told him uh, the regime of eating whole food, plant-based, no oil. And he just turned to my sister and said, you know, Helen, if you eat this way, it will help your health. And she stopped her tears and, oh. and she said, I'll do it. And so she has done it ever since. What do you think about the meals that I fixed for you, Helen? I love it. Yeah. She and thanked what, me for every meal. What has happened? What's happened to you and Helen? That's that's a great story. You know, you really uh, you really emphasize a message that I've had for a lot of people in mixed families. That is just do it. And pretty soon people will say, Why bother kicking the meat and the cheese? And you know, what I really like your soup, the way you made it and so, yeah, as an individual, just starting out, you change your whole family, which is how Mary and I would really like it, like it to be done in, in mixed families. So I'd like to hear more, please. You provided lots of recipes for us on your website, and I'm so grateful for that. Um, Helen and I lost about 100 pounds each. Well, each? Um, yep. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And I got to be on the cover of Woman's World magazine for my oh. weight loss. So that's me on the cover. Along well, I, with hope you, I hope you mentioned our name. Absolutely. Throughout the entire article, I talked about how oh. I considered myself. Let me, let, let me see that issue again. Tell me what issue that I didn't see that. But, and which issue is that? This is a heal your gut issue because I'd had a lot of uh, problems with IBS. Uh -huh. and, and then I also was on A Woman's World. They used the same picture twice. You oh, know, wow, wow. This was another issue with me. They didn't choose to use my recipes, but um, they choose, they chose to do some recipes that I told them that I really liked. And so, yeah, we, we just feel like if there's any way that we can um, help pay back, we try and encourage other people to eat the way we do. And I, I tell them to get a copy of the starch solution or uh, the maximum weight loss book. And, um, you know, I was a teacher for many years, taught elementary school. And the big thing that we used to say was we're out there planting seeds. And we often quoted a, um, a quote from uh, Dr. Albert Schweitzer. It's not always given the sower to, to see the harvest. And I just felt like today I wanted you to know that there's a big harvest out there that you may not even know about. So well, there are thousands I've, I've of us. Who consider thank ourselves McDouglers. So thank you for changing our lives and the lives of those that we come in contact with. So sorry to get emotional, but it changed me dramatically. Well, so, if you want to make my day a little bit better, the beginning of the year 2024, first day of the year, tell me what happened to you. You lost over 100 pounds each. You had indigestion problems. I mean, I'm ha I'm, I'm having to drag this out of you. <laughs> Did you get off any medication? Do you feel, does your gut feel better? I mean, and your sister, if you could just spend a few minutes making me feel good. Okay. Helen was a type two diabetic and it cured mm -hmm. that totally. So she was on three medications for that. And so she's no longer on those medications at all. I was on um, many, many medications, um, cut out about 16 of the medications that I was taking. Um, I still take a, a few medications, but compared to what I was on, uh, just dramatic change. Um, we, I, I used to not be able to, I had to use a walker to get around the last year that I taught. And so I was known as the teacher with the flower in her hair and the walker on, at her side. And um, anyway, I, I did have some knee surgeries and things that helped me, but I never thought I'd be able to really run again or do be active again. And I now volunteer at an equestrian center that caters to the disabled where I get horses ready and I lead horses during the lesson. And we have to run to trot the horses for the riders. And I never thought I'd ever be able to run and I can run now. And I, wow. I'm not tired and people marvel when I tell them that I used to weigh hundred pounds more. They think, no, really? They couldn't imagine me uh, weighing yeah. so much more. So it, it truly has changed our lives dramatically. Um, Helen can get out there and walk, and um, I make her use a walker just because she's sometimes a little unsteady. But you know, at seventy, almost seventy-seven, she's she's doing well. 
So our health is dramatically well, improved. Marty, do you have a before picture of either of you? And also, can you either tell or show Dr. McDougall what Linda told you to always carry with you? Okay. I, I don't have a before picture other than the one that's on the front of the magazine. Sorry about that. I, I feel like I just told my story last week, which I did too. Uh, right. Dr. McDougall didn't see it. Can you tell him what Linda Middlesworth told you to always have on you 24 hours a day? She said, always have a bag of potatoes with you. And I, oh, yeah. I found Yukon Golds and sweet potatoes were my favorites. And I would make sure I had those cooked in a little baggie that I took with me. And anytime I saw anything that tempted me at all, I'd just pull out my baggie wherever I was and start eating potatoes. And it just saved me and still does. I, I still carry around. I, my favorites now are Japanese sweet potatoes, which I air fry and keep in a little baggie and um, take with me wherever I go. So it works out great for me. So thank you for the potato uh, thing that, that saved my world. Yeah, the potatoes are up to, well, Chef AJ and I would certainly agree that the potatoes, you know, it's, it's the, the pillar of worldwide world, world nutrition. It's what's to save many populations in the past, save many individuals today, and will be a future food because, you know, potatoes grow so, so many places and so under so many conditions and they provide so many calories compared to other starches. So you pick the right starch. Uh, one of the things um, that I want to did you have, did you suffer a lot making this this change from the way you used to eat to uh, to a starch based meal plan? Was it difficult for you? Uh, Not for me. It's some of the things that may have gotten in the way. Yeah, it's interesting yeah. that some people truly feel like they can't sustain it. But for me, it was wonderful because I had had to limit the amount of food that I was eating my whole life. I felt like okay, one little six ounce container of yogurt was what I would have for lunch as a teacher. And I just feel like now I, I Linda Mills were told me to eat more. If I felt like I wasn't, if I felt weak or something, she said, just eat more vegetables, eat more beans, eat more greens. And so I started trying to do that. And it was hard at first to eat more. That was the thing because my whole life, you know, 64 years, I tried to limit the amount of food that I was putting in my body. And now I could eat till I felt full. And so it was just fun to feel like I could eat and I could feel full and still lose weight. So I, I just love the fact that I don't have to limit anymore. I don't have to weigh the amount of food or count calories. I don't have to do any of those things that I used to do, which means that this is just a much easier diet for me, uh, a way of life, a way of eating uh, that has been very helpful. Helen has to rely on me to get her food for her. So I do yeah. make her way once a week to make sure I'm giving her the right amounts. But uh, she's doing well. She's yeah, about at that hundred pounds loss. Uh, all the well, time. Let me let me let me ask you. I, you saw your sister get better. I, I assume your husband get better. Got better. Can can you picture some of your friends? that need this program, you know, of starch-based meal plan. Can you think of them and can you imagine any of them starting the program that you started and not having the same results that you had? I can't imagine what would you not expect having the same, the same results. results? Or were you just somebody special? Or would you look around you and say, hey, if everybody did this, everybody would give us the same results? I mean, I, once yeah. you understand this right. and you see the world from this point of view, every place you look, you go to a shopping center, you go out to eat, you see some of your friends and relatives, you know why they're in trouble. You look at their, their, their dinner plate and, and you know what would happen to them if they just made a simple change to eating the bulk of their foods from starch and limiting the oils and the animals. It, would, it always works. You know, you and I and AJ are not exceptions. It always works because that's the problem, it's the food. So uh, 2024 it is today, and uh, you have a great story, and I'm sure glad you brought your sister along. But um, what do you think? Any advice you'd give to the average listener out here? Because I have to say, you are a star McDougaller, and that's one of the more interesting stories I've heard, but it's not unusual. 
it's typical. So uh, any thoughts you've had that you'd like, if you had a chance to talk to the whole world, you do. When you're on Chef AJ's show, you're talking to the world. And That's what I'm discovering. You've discovered, what, five years you've been doing this, so. Yeah, I, I really wish that everyone would give it a, a three-week chance. You know, if you just would try it for three weeks and see how you feel. Some people say, I've only made it through a week. They they go through a week and they go, okay, I can't do it anymore. And I think, did you lose weight in that week? Oh, yeah, yeah, I lost weight. But but I, I don't think I could I could do this. I love meat too much. And I think, oh, my goodness, I love animals too much. You know, it, it's what what are you doing to the world? And I think we, we don't let people know about what's happening to the environment. You know, people think they care so much about the environment. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, I just find myself thinking you really haven't investigated thoroughly enough to care about the environment if you're still eating animal products. So anyway, I, I just feel that if people would just try it, just give it a try, it can't hurt. It can't, it can't kill you for two or three weeks. But I wish they would just try it and see how it makes them feel. Because I felt better right away. You know, I suffer from all kinds of uh, problems, fibromyalgia, irritable bowel syndrome, migraine headaches, uh, myofascial pain syndrome, chronic fatigue. You know, I had lots of issues and now I really don't suffer from those anymore. So, and I don't have to take the medications, the pain medications and preventative medications that I was on for so long. So it's certainly it's much cheaper. Um, people say, oh, it'd be too expensive to go on a plant-based diet. And I think, well, the cost of meat these days is just horrendous. You can just eliminate that and understand that your medications would cut back as well. And you would feel better. Everything you put in your mouth takes a toll on your body. And you just need to understand that when you're putting the right foods in your mouth, your body will thank you and respond accordingly. So it's made a huge difference to me. We are grateful to be McDouglers and will always be McDouglers and try to help the world to, to make changes as well. So I can't thank you enough. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And your wife as well. And all those well, who work with you. Your work has made a huge difference in the lives of thousands of us that you don't even know about. So thank you. Well, thank you. It always feels good to hear that we've made a difference. Uh, you know, I don't think I'll ever get over that that kind of pleasure to know that I, I've helped people like you and... and uh, what people under, need to understand is uh, this always works. If you're suffering from dietary diseases, which 91% of people, it was just a study out. In fact, we're going to talk about it next Sunday night. But just a study out that showed that 91% of people are over fat in our society. 63% of the children are over fat. Everybody is sick and everybody would get well if they change the source of their calories from animal foods and oil to starch and a few vegetables and fruits. It's just too darn simple. But hopefully the year 2024 is gonna be the year when, when you know the truth wins out. Uh, I sure hope so, I think so. I actually, I have, to, I, I have come to a, a, a viewpoint of optimism because I can't stand living in pep, pep, pessimism. It's just too difficult. And so I look forward to the next at least three or four years as being ones of enlightenment, a renaissance, a renaissance in everything in the world, including nutrition, I expect to see in the next three or four years as a consequence of, of uh, smartphones, <laughs> of communication. You know, 86% of the people in the world, of the 8 billion people, you know, like almost 7 billion of them, have communication devices right in hand. So, I mean, if they could hear your story, and they will, and what, what, what intelligent people who love themselves wouldn't do this? It just makes so much sense. In fact, it's such nonsense. It's so hard to believe. And all of you who are, you know, believers, you're the choir, you know this. It's hard to believe that people don't get it. And they suffer so much that they buy into such nonsense like Ozempic spends $17,000 to lose 37 pounds. You spent nothing, save money to lose 100. 
and then they reach a plateau at 38 weeks and they don't lose anymore. You got down, you reached your plateau when you got so thin, you looked in the mirror and you wondered whether you ought to be eating a few nuts and seeds to gain a little weight. Yeah, it's just so crazy the way the world is and particularly the world of medicine and nutrition. But I don't know. I, I, I Like I say, I have optimism and faith that the truth will rise to the top. But your story was certainly, like I say, it, it wasn't it wasn't uh, unique. It was typical, but it was sort of well told. And I uh, thank you for getting on, on this kind of media. And if you would uh, send me a photo or a um, scanned copy of of these articles, I'd sort of appreciate it. Or let me know where to buy them. I'd love to keep them in my collection. Thank you. Thank you so much, Margie, and nice to meet you, Helen. And Helen, we've invited you if you'd like to come and tell your story at another time, because it's also wonderful. Happy New Year to both of you. Thank Happy you. New Year. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Bye -bye. So, Dr. McDougal, I mean, we could do this all day. Like, you would not believe how many people want to meet you. I mean, I got to kind of like limit it because you have a show to do. But we're going to give a gift to somebody that watches regularly because I had mentioned to Dr. McDougal when I came on that this is not, I don't wear this color a lot. Like, it's like some kind of psychic connection that we often match or I have read on, he has read on. And so Dr. McDougal was saying that we're, I'll give the prize, I'll give it one of my eBooks to the first person that can show if Dr. McDougal ever wore the same shirt twice on any of the broadcasts he's done on Chef AJ Live. I know at least six of the shirts came from me. I, I, is that Patrick James you're wearing today? No, I have a much less expensive shirt. Well, Thank it, you. it always looks right. Patrick so, James is a little, a, little, a little out of my budget. But those are nice but, shirts. Uh, yeah, I... I, I so the, the shirts I buy are nice shirts, but uh, but they... You know, it's one of the things I started doing about five years ago after the fires when I lost all my shirts. And I used to wear different shirts all the time and, you know, really outspoken shirts. And I know it's kind of my, my protest to get back into living was to just wear a different shirt on every show. And I have pretty much done that over the last five years. But I'm glad we compliment ourselves. Yeah. Well, I'm putting so. that if anybody can show that you wore the same shirt twice, no worries, feel less at help at chefaj.live, chefaj.com, and we will give them a prize. I'll give them an ebook or something. Do you do you have any plans for today? And what did you do New Year's Eve? <laughs> we went to sleep. Same here. So you know, we, we don't. No, no, no interest in partying. We watched, well, Mary actually watched the uh, the New York Times ball fall. To, you know, to bring in the new year. And she's much more of a of a holiday participant than I am. She gets excited about Christmas and Halloween and birthdays. And thank goodness there's somebody that lives in my household who's not a bah humbug. <laughs> so she keeps these things very exciting. So we, we watched a little bit of the New York uh, bringing in the new year. Saw all the, all the people, my goodness. You know, all over the world, all the people. Isn't that shocking when you... When you see these broadcasts, of, uh, and you realize this this is more than your old community. We had a, we had a nice experience yesterday. We had some friends over, friends over for uh, lunch, and uh, they had just gotten back from Europe. And one of the more exciting things they went on a, a couple of vegan cruises in Europe. And um, one of the more exciting things that I heard it goes back to what we just did with this uh, interview with Margie is that <clears throat> our name is really big in Europe. You know, every place they went, everybody they talked to, uh, of course, they were, we had, had a biased audience. They were on vegan cruises, but they were aware of the McDougal work. So, oh, you know, I know I know we're pretty big in China also and Japan. And uh, and it, and in it, it large part, it's the fact that Chef AJ and I have had a relationship where we've been doing these shows for about four years together at least. Yeah, every month. Four years, Dr. <laughs> and sometimes McDougal. extra. Can you believe that we're going on our fifth year? Incredible. Yeah, right. Well, why not? I, I predict, I still think, because of the truth and the value of our information, that we're going to become viral. You know, I hope so. Just think about what happened with these GLP-1 agonists. Wegovi, Zepbound, Ozempic. You know, they, they, over the last two or three years, they have become worldwide sensation. People, you know, they they mortgage their houses to get this medication that costs a thousand a month. If such nonsense like that, 
can spread the truth. It ought to stand a chance, I would think. I mean, good grief. We're talking about solving the problem. Ozempic, you lose your appetite. The McDougal program, you enjoy food. You love it. Your appetite's strong. You eat. Ozempic, you reach a plateau. If you started at 230 pounds, the average plateau hits you after you lost 38 pounds. Then you stop because the body wants to survive. On our program, you don't stop till you hit trim body weight. On Ozempic, you get nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, because it is derived from a reptile venom from the Gila monster. It's poison. They, they make this GLP-1 agonist, the, the Ozempic, Wegovi, Zepbound, et cetera. They, they make this out of the venom that comes out of the lower jaw of a reptile that lives in the southwest United States, the Gila monster. And it how does what Gila monster poison does. And they, how did they figure this out, Dr. McDougal? Well, they noticed that when you got a Gila monster bite, which only lasted a few seconds, you lost your appetite, you threw up, you got nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. That's how they figured it out. They figured, well, if we could introduce this long-term in people, you know, they could lose their food hunger, they call it. They make them sick. If we can induce this, if we can cause the effects of Gila monster poison to last for many hours or maybe a day. And they did in the chemistry lab. They found ways of, uh, of making the effects last long, a day and now a week. Some of these medications are a shot a week and sometimes a pill. Mm -hmm. So that's how they developed it. Uh, they, they learned how to get people to stop eating and make them sick. And of course, the low carbers, they knew this for, well, for 100 years. This is the Atkins diet I'm talking to you about. You know, the yeah. uh, you, you talked about the low carb diet fraud last month. That's right, didn't I? Yeah, these people for 100 years they've figured out at least that if you don't eat any carbohydrate, you go into ketosis and you lose your appetite because ketosis occurs naturally when you're very sick. So, anyway, you got a choice when it comes to eating. No, that wasn't my point. My point was that if such nonsense as dieting, food restriction, which has been popular my whole lifetime and probably forever, people could buy into. If low-carb diets that make you sick, where you eat, eat the entire, well, half, half the environmental consequence, the animal foods, you know, that if people can do that, if they can take and do this GLP-1 stuff, they ought to be able to, to buy into eating as much as they want of food they love. And it's good for the planet and good for animals. It just makes no sense. Of course, I don't think the entire world makes any sense. So I guess it does make sense if you look at it from that point of view. Maybe things are supposed to be chaotic. Maybe you're supposed to suffer. Maybe the world is supposed to end. Well, some of these thoughts I don't particularly care for. So I've been trying to at least make the one about health right. And I've also tried to make the one about the planet right. Many of you know, and you all should know, that Mary and I developed a website on diet and climate. It's under the link McDougal Foundation, one word, McDougalFoundation.org, not com, dot org. And you'll see the web website we developed for individuals to change their diet to be planet friendly. Anyway, that's uh, that, that's what I predict is we're going to have the McDougal diet as the counter to the Ozempic program because we're better and we're cheaper and we're more effective and we're something you can live with and we're cheap. <laughs> In fact, you'll cut your food bill by 60%. You know, so that's my campaign for 2024. Do you remember FenFen? Fen? Yeah, I remember FenFen Fen until it started causing cardiac problems. Right. So I took it in the 90s and of course it worked. But the thing is, is it only worked as long as you took it. And then you got that letter from the FDA and you had to have an echocardiogram. With these drugs like uh, like Ozempic and Wagovi, have they been around long enough to know that what the long-term side effects for some of these people might be? Because lots of celebrities are taking it now. Well, for sure, when you stop it, you regain the weight. I mean, that ought to be something disturbing to most people that they have to remain sick at a cost of $1,000 a month 
for the rest of their life. You're stuck. You know, why don't you just eat oatmeal for breakfast or hash brown potatoes or pancakes or, you know, go out for lunch and dinner for bean burritos and or just potatoes. Actually, that's that's what we had last night for, for dinner to, I guess, to bring in the new year is we had sweet potatoes and broccoli, one of our favorite meals. And Mary yeah. made some peanut sauce because it was a holiday. She made it out of, out of, out of uh, what is it, PB2? Nice. That, you that's know, uh, low-fat peanut butter. I've eaten sweet Hannah yam, which is a type of sweet potato and broccoli every day for lunch for, well, I started January 2nd, 2012. So I guess 12 years now. See, from our point of view, because we've learned differently to have to sit down and eat, you know, some of the typical American foods, particularly without the salt, sugar and spice covering up their tastes would be really, really revolting. I mean, can you eat a piece of boiled chicken or boiled beef? You know, you've got to cover it up with steak sauce or barbecue sauce to eat it. You, you couldn't eat cheese unless they put a, a ton of salt in it. You couldn't eat, you couldn't drink milk except for the fact that it's 30% sugar right out of the cow. And then they add more sugar to make ice cream and yogurt and so on so that you can get it down. It's so disgusting. You know, anyway. But but I, I think things are, are, are going to be very, very positive at least over the next few years, AJ. I'm excited about it. After that, I don't know. Well, I'm I'm 76 years old, so after that, I don't really count that many after that. So I'm hoping for a few good ones, but... Nice. Did you have a... Anyway, to... I put together for you... Let me, let me tell you what I put together, because, you know, I, I've given you the, the uh, video lectures... You know, and they're all up on YouTube on heart disease and cancer and breast cancer and diabetes and weight loss and you know, all the things we've been talking about. And I don't I don't mind repeating those lectures because I love giving them the first time. And I'll be glad to do it. And part, parts of it I will do. And on, on on Saturday nights, excuse me, on Sunday nights, Mary and I and Heather get together for a live YouTube presentation at five o'clock Pacific time where I will update things and tell you some of my new thoughts every Sunday night. And then Chef AJ allows me on her show every Monday, and the first Monday of every month, not every Monday, the first Monday of every month, and, you know, we'll bring things up to date there. But a long time ago, I started a, a list of things that I'd like to be remembered by in terms of things that I've stated. And I originally called these epitaphs because I figured you could at least put one of them on my gravestone except I'm not going to be buried. <laughs> so uh, I put together these, I just over the last couple of days, I put together 55 years of things that I've said. Uh, they're not necessarily original. So don't, don't fault me on that. I don't know that there's anything original, but these are things that I would like to be known for. And we'll be able to just cover a few of them today. And then what I'd like to do over, over the next few Mondays is I would like to be able to go over the, the list further. And I'll give you the whole list for now, and I'll be updating it and, and so on. But these are the things that I've said in the, in, in the recent past, in the distant past, that I'd like you to understand why I said them and to be able to refer to these things when you need a, a, emotional support or when, you're, uh, use, when you need some messages to share with friends and family. You know, refer to some of these quotes and and hit them with these. And if they want to see supporting evidence, the books, the videos, the newsletters, five o'clock Sunday night presentations, the Chef AJ shows, they're all there. The science is clear and consistent. So let me go through a few of these uh, thoughts that I've had. And most recently, one of the things that's come up, of course, whenever you have detractors, they're going to find things that support their reason for detraction. They're going to find negative things. They're going to cherry pick as always. There's new human nature. I expect it. In fact, I'm amazed if you put in, in, in the internet, McDougal and adverse effects or McDougal is bad or whatever, how, how few things you come up with, uh, particularly living in the world that we live in and how cruel people can be. But one of the things that's been said lately is, People have read my books. The last book I published was in uh, uh, 2011. So that's been 12 years ago. And the first book I published was in 1984. 
So uh, people correctly criticize me because I use literature in my books before 2011. Well, how would I do otherwise? I can't see in the future. So I, references appear in books appropriate to the date I published them. Fortunately, prior to 1984, basically everything important had been worked out in terms of nutrition and medicine. Let me say that again, the truth was known during the previous hundred and sometimes a thousand years, the tr truth was known about diet and medical care, which are my interests. Diet therapy is my interests. So uh, if they were right before 1984, they ought to be right now. Because folks, because folks, then it's the reason I keep saying the same thing over and over again, it's because, folks, the truth don't change. The truth don't change. All right. And I want you to remember me for that, although it's not an original quote. And if you criticize me for using old data, two points. One, they had it right the first time. And two, two, the truth don't change. But what I've done on our upcoming presentations, and I'll continue to do, as I have, because I'm a I'm a passionate reader of research and science. That's what I do. You know, I I'm in the process right now of reading a couple of novels, but most of my time is spent in the journals. And so what I do is I pick out articles that are current. And you may come to the conclusion that I have cherry-picked these articles. No, no, ladies and gentlemen, these are majority opinions. This is what doctors are coming to the conclusion of today, which I said back in 1984. And before, you know, like heart surgery doesn't save lives. This is now the consensus opinion. I'll talk to you about this next Sunday night. Just a major article. It doesn't save lives. You know, it goes on and on and on the things that I've been trying to tell you. As researchers look over these particular principles, the truth don't change. And they come to the same conclusions, even when many of them have heavy biases because they work for the drug and the food industries, or they happen to sit down to a dinner plate of cheesecake and steaks. So they can't they can't see the truth of money and their own personal habits get in their way. But anyway, that's what I've been dealing with lately in terms of, of, of the, the major critique against McDougall is in his books, which were published before 2011. He uses research that's dated before 2011. Anyway. The truth is, is that uh, we suffer from food poisoning. And I've tried to make it really simple for people to understand And the categories of food poison are two. There's, there's other poisons we deal with, like tobacco poisoning. And, and then that comes from tobacco. And there's alcohol poisoning. We know what that, that is from, and we know what to do, right? Okay, well, when it comes to food, we can make it almost that simple. Instead of just one thing you have to change, tobacco or alcohol, there are just two things. There are two sources of food poisoning. And those two sources of food poisoning are animal foods and free oils. Free oils, you know, that, that that's... A new term for many people. Free oils is when you take the oil out of an orange and you have orange oil, or out of a peanut and you have peanut oil, or out of an olive and you have olive oil. You leave everything behind except the oil. These free agents, these free nutrients, cause nutritional imbalances which kill and make you sick. You get oil from the food when it's intact. All right, so the two categories of food poison are anything from an animal. That means an animal part or an animal secretion or excretion. You don't eat and no free oils. And so people are saying to themselves, well, well there's nothing safe to eat. So I eat. Well, there is something safe to eat and that is starch. That's what you're supposed to eat. That's what human beings have eaten through all of history. The majority of people who walk this earth have consumed the bulk of their calories from starch. When I talk about the bulk, I'm talking about over 90% of the calories consumed in various populations for probably a million years. 
have come from starches, various starches with fruits and vegetables. But none of these people were vegan. They found a little animal around that looked somewhat desirable. Well, for what reason? I don't know. Often to reward the females in the village. The man, men came back and brought them a little animal as a reward. And you know what happened then. Anyway, uh, they weren't vegan, but 90% of their food was starch and the rest was fruits and vegetables and a little bit of meat here and there. And of course, there are exceptions you could point out, but there are exceptions. There are small populations of people, like the Inuit Eskimo or, or, the, or the, the tribes in Africa. There are a few tribes in Africa that eat this way. <clears throat> anyway, it's a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables. As soon as you figure that out and start eating well, you'll get the results that I've offered to you. I, oh, I promised them to you because this is what will happen. You know, I've taken care of 12,000 people. I've touched, talked to 12,000 people over the past uh, 55 years. And I've learned a lot. And uh, most of the things I've learned uh, are solidly backed by scientific research. So others have seen the same thing. Anyway, um, okay. So the, the next category I wanna to talk to you about is a general nutrition. There, there are certain things I've told you, I, and again, I, I would like these, I would hope that these are quotes that when you hear them, you'll say, oh, McDougal used to say that. Not necessarily that I, I'm original, but I used to say that. I used to want you to learn that. Uh, things like uh, juicy. A lot of people uh, are, uh, think that we have a deficiency of nutrients. And what we need to do is we need to somehow release more nutrients from our foods so that, so that we correct our diseases because we suffer from nutrient deficiencies. Well, how many of your friends suffer from nutrient deficiencies? You have friends with scurvy, beriberi, pellagra? I don't think so. You have, you have friends with problems of excess. You're not going to cure problems of excess, excess calories, excess fat, excess cholesterol, excess protein. You're not going to cure these problems of excess by treating deficiency diseases with more vitamins and minerals. And what you do by juicing is you release more vitamins and minerals and more calories too. So it's going to be less helpful when you eat juiced foods as opposed to eating them whole. You do, not, you do not improve the quality of a fruit or vegetable by hitting it a, a thousand times the steel blade. What happens is the insulin levels go higher. The blood sugars go lower. You, the appetite returns quicker and stronger after you have damaged the food. So it's better to eat your food intact, in other words, whole food, however, I want to add a side note. Uh, minor refining, such as white rice and you know some of the corn meals that are made, you know it's it's a minor issue. But we don't teach you to eat refined foods. We we encourage you to eat them whole. Some of you are going to come back to me and say, you know, hey doc, you know I, I like I like my pasta so refined. I, that whole wheat pasta is just too much. You'll still do well on refined pasta white rice, but that, that's not the best you can do. So uh, the uh, to carry along with this, this discussion of, of damaging your fruits and vegetables, how about taking supplements? How, how about buying damaged food and extractions of damaged food and concentrations and isolations of damaged food? What we're talking about here is we're talking about vitamin supplements and mineral supplements. We're not talking about, about natural medicines, all right? Like St. John's wort. Uh, there are a whole bunch of, uh, Google lipid. There are a whole bunch of natural herbal medicines that sometimes people call supplements. No, they're natural medicine. We're talking about, about, about components of food that are removed, which you're adding back in a concentrated isolated form. And when you do that by taking a pill, you create nutritional imbalances. Because you flood the system with one particular 
nutrient. And the system's designed to, to accept a, an array of vitamins and minerals and other phytochemicals that is proper for the human being. And this relationship has been developing over hundreds of millions of years. So that so that your intestinal tract and your, your body needs meat, what is being delivered by the potato and the rice and the fruit and the vegetable. But when you flood the system with concentrated isolated nutrients, which you buy as supplements, you know, pills and liquids, you 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 cause imbalances in this natural, delicate system. And as a result, what we find in scientific studies is that people who take supplements have an increased risk of dying. The Cochrane Collaboration of Respected Organization says that for a million one-a-day vitamin takers, one-a-day supplements, there are 9,000 extra deaths due to the supplements. You increase your risk of uh, heart disease and cancers and overall mortality somewhere between 10 and 30% based on major studies done when you take these supplements because you create nutritional imbalances. You disrupt the system. It can't defend and repair. So don't take these supplements. Uh, the only exception that we offer is to take a supplement B12, which you know, needs to be added to this list. I'll update it. Okay. Uh, there's no such thing as dietary calcium deficiency, yet an entire industry is based on this. There has never been a case of calcium deficiency ever described on any natural diet. That's what the research says. So when the dairy industry comes out and promotes all this need for calcium, you say, show me the research. And they say, well, how about osteoporosis? Well, osteoporosis is not due to calcium deficiency. It's due to protein excess. It's due to excess acid derived from eating animal foods. That's what it's due to. So no such thing as calcium deficiency. And you, when you buy into this message, you buy into... Um, the problems of eating more dairy and the problems eating more dairy and more, and more of the typical chronic diseases, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, obesity, et cetera, <clears throat> constipation even. So, all right. So there's no such thing as calcium deficiency. There's no such thing as protein deficiency. It's, it's impossible to design a protein deficient diet unless you do it in a laboratory. You know, vegan diets don't even come close to to failing when it comes to the need for protein. It's never a problem. Yet, I have to say the most important nutrient, at least according to the supermarkets and the advertisements I see on TV, the most important nutrient that you can seek out for you and your family is protein. There's never been a case of protein deficiency. And when you buy into this, you end up taking an excess protein you know, to meet these tremendous needs, which we don't have. And you take in much too much protein, and as a result, the body has to eliminate it. And it has to metabolize it in the liver, which overworks the liver. It metabolizes in the kidneys, which overworks the kidneys and causes them to fail too. And causes the body to lose the bones into the toilet. The bones are dissolved from these high-protein diets, and they're excreted in the through the kidneys into the toilet. In the process, they form calcium-based kidney stones. So it's, it's, it's harmful to believe in messages of industry such as calcium deficiency and protein deficiency. You end up erring on the side of harm to you and your family. All right, how about, um, how about uh, consuming dairy in general? In, in a chapter in the book, The Start Solution, uh, the final subset subsection is titled, uh, Dairy is a Dirty Word. Dirty, dirty, dirty in terms of environmental contaminants, dioxins, DDT, PCBs, all kinds of environmental chemicals. You suck up into dairy products. And how about microbes? Now, dairy is the, the most recalled of any of our food groups by the FDA because of contamination with microbes. Listeria, mad cow, Salmonella, staphylococci, on and on and on and on. Dairy products are infected. It's a dirty word. Uh, when it comes to 
when it comes to simple sugars, this is actually a, uh, a, a comment that came up recently when we had a, a couple over for lunch I told you about. Question was, well, how about simple sugars? Now, now, this is a person who would like to lose a little bit of weight and follows the McDougal diet strictly. So the question is, uh, how should I answer her properly for her particular needs? Well, first of all, sugar, pure white sugar, table sugar, it's empty calories. It's concentrated calories. It's four calories per gram. When you add water and fiber, you change this to starch, which is only one calorie per gram. But pure sugar is very concentrated calories. And they're also empty calories. And they're calories the body would prefer to burn over fat. And so when you eat sugar, the body uses the sugar for daily activities and leaves the fat on your buttocks, thigh, or abdomen. Simple sugars rot your teeth. Simple sugars provide calories without protein or fat. And that's good. And that results in a diet known as the Kempter diet, which is an extreme taking care of people who are are very ill. It's a diet that's 94% sugar. It's fruit, fruit juice, white rice, and table sugar. People thrive on this kind of diet. But they shouldn't misinterpret to say, well, it's okay if I include as much sugar as I want in my diet because it makes me feel better. Rots teeth, raises triglycerides, discourages weight loss. I think you ought to think twice about it. It should be a flavoring at most. And what we recommend is that people consume for enjoyment, only for enjoyment, about half a teaspoon, maybe a teaspoon of sugar sprinkled over the surface of their foods daily. And when it comes to salt, that's another misunderstood nutrient. We need minerals. That's why we have tip uh, taste buds for minerals on the tip of the tongue. So, well, you need a certain amount of minerals, and sodium provides minerals. Not just two, but, well, unless it's some kind of salts provide other minerals too. But it provides minerals, which we seek. And they're necessary for good health. The problem is when you eat too low of sodium, you cause the adrenal glands to become activated. And they release aldosterone and angiotensin, which conserves sodium. Aldosterone and angiotensin also raise blood pressure. So they're, they're in a way, in a roundabout way, by the effects of the adrenal glands, they actually, a very low sodium diet would uh, be harmful for the adrenal glands in the body. But then on the other end, you can get too much salt. So anyway, you need a little bit of, of mineral, a little salt in your diet to keep the, the aldosterone and the angiotensin suppressed like they should be. But you could go on the other end too. You could eat huge amounts of salt, which have been associated with strokes, primarily strokes. And so we don't want to do that, but we need a compromise a little bit, not too much, just like protein, just like carbohydrates, just like essential fats, a little bit, but not enough. So the idea that you need to eat a sugar-free and salt-free diet, I don't believe in. Because you, number one, you love these, these flavors. And sprinkled on the surface of food, you're going to do well. You're going to uh, be in good health and uh, also enjoy your food. The uh, last nutrient I didn't talk to you about was essential fats. And you should remember my statements on essential fats. These would be your omega-3 fats. Uh, the message out there is to eat fish, or at least to buy omega-3 flats fat, flaxseed supplements to get your omega-3 fats. You're told you got to do that. Well, omega-3 fats are essential fats. They must be in your diet, just like omega-6 fats. They are only made by plants. No animal, no fish can make an omega-3 or an omega-6 fat. So, so where do the fish get the omega-3s? By eating algae and seaweed. Plants make omega-3s. You cannot develop omega-3 fatty acid deficiency on a whole plant food-based diet, starch-based diet. You shouldn't be taking these supplements. These supplements, omega-3 fats, they, well, the fat you eat the fat you wear. So they're going to at least discourage weight loss. 
these fats, uh, some cause the blood clot, some of them cause you to bleed. All of them promote cancers and obesity and diabetes. And some of them promote heart disease. Some of them don't. So they should be obtained in their natural packages, which is starches, vegetables, and fruits. You'll never miss. Don't take these supplements. They will uh, make you sick, not just to bleach your bank account. So anyway, AJ, I think I'd like to stop there and uh, maybe continue in our next uh, our next session next month in February and go through some more of these things. Uh, uh, if, if you like, I'd like to open up for questions if anybody has any thoughts about. And also, if you can think of things that I've said that have stuck in your mind that you think I should include in this list, because I've been doing this for, well, in your household for 40 years. You know, write me, Dr. McDougall, drmcdougall.com, and I'll add this to the list. As it is, I told you this is a rough draft. Okay. And, but maybe it'll be helpful for people to, to have it in such a simplified form. This is not hard, folks. This is pretty easy. Well, you have time if you'd like to keep going. I have questions that were submitted in advance, but I don't know. I mean, they're not necessarily on what you talked about today, but That's would right. you like me to ask ask at least a couple of them and see if, if you want to take a stab? And then, of course, guys, this would be the time now to put questions in the chat. So this is from Sharon, and she said that... Um, she has a mammogram every year. However, this year her doctor suggested she also have a breast ultrasound. She breasts breasts. Uh, she said she did and everything was fine. But her question is: Is there a way to prevent dense breasts through diet? Did eating too much fat in her diet cause this? Yes, uh, the research I have in mind is named Boyd, B O Y D. Uh, published in the Journal of the National um, Journal uh, Journal of the National Institutes of Health. Published in uh, 1991, uh, Boyd showed that a low-fat diet was associated with less dense breasts, and that a high typical American diet is associated with a, a dense breast. Now, the reason dense breasts are associated with more breast cancer is because you get dense breasts by stimulating the breast tissue with estrogen. Estrogen promotes breast cancer and also causes the breasts to thicken, stimulates the growth of the breast tissue so they look thicker on a mammogram. And that's the association. It comes back to the estrogen, which comes back to the food, which is related to the food itself, plus the chemicals, the the uh, xenoestrogens that industry makes that ended up in our foods due to bioaccumulation from the food chain. So yeah, you, you could change your breasts. It'll be associated with overall weight loss. You're going to lose body fat too. And you, and Boyd's research, you have any trouble finding it, write me and I'll send you the paper. Boyd's research clearly shows that. Journal of the National Cancer Institute, 1991, guy named Boyd. Look it up. You, you probably, on your first trip through Google, you'll probably find the article. So Dr. McDougall, if she were, maybe she's changed to a low-fat starch-based diet, but will that help the breasts be less dense in the future? Yes, the Boyd's work, work shows. Is that's exactly what he did for women with dense breasts. He put them on a low-fat diet and showed their breast density decreased. And, you know, it was exciting back then. This is, you know, this is a long time ago, was it? 30 years ago. And people were kind of excited about it, but they lost interest, you know, just like so many other things. You see the diet is the cause and the cure. You get excited about breast cancer and heart disease and diabetes, and then they forget it and they go back to the pills. And be sick. Except for a few of us who've decided that, look, life is too short. It's too precious. Now we want to, to live it differently the best we can. We want to look, feel, and function our best. So yes, you will, you'll be able to, but the important thing is that you reduce your risk of breast cancer going forward. That's the important thing, not whether your breasts are dense or not. You know, this is just something found on a mammogram, which is due to overstimulation of the breasts. 
from estrogen, which is due to the food. It's food. Yeah, it, it just, it, you know, I have this little mug. I got you one, you know, a little reminder mug, right? But I think at, at least in the vegan or plant-based world, that seems to be the biggest source of disagreement, you know, starch versus fat, you know, nuts versus potatoes. Well, it's too bad that they, 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 they make their their premises uh, on something besides research. So, you know, I, I, unless you are passionate about the science and read it and understand it and know the tricks, you think all science is equal. Just like in politics, you think all of the politics are equal until you start looking into it. And then you find, my goodness, they say drastically different things. And there are reasons why. And not all those reasons have to do with the truth and science. So I'm I'm real happy with the position that I've taken, both in politics and science. So uh, those of you who want to live in ignorance, what can I do? I'll try and enlighten you. People, you know, people tell a story that they believe in, and if you believe in the story that teaches that you need high protein, high high calcium you know, lots of calories diet. If that's if that's the story you live, live by and the disease is not only, the cause is not known, but it's not treatable or the cause is her emotional problems or I don't know, maybe maybe aliens shooting lasers down at people. I don't know what you, what, what story you buy into, but you're buying into a story that makes you and keeps you sick. Why not try another story? That, try a story that tells you're supposed to look good, feel good, and function well. And that's what all your friends and neighbors and medical people should see. Even though you may be overweight and sick, they should see a healthy, trim, fully functional person in front of them who has not been able to express this, this personal appearance and activity because of the story they believe. They believe starches are fattening. And they believe that you have to eat meat for protein and, and dairy for calcium. Well, look at the results, 91. I, I'm going to talk to you about the paper on so next Sunday night. The new data out, 91% of people, 91% of people are overweight, over fat. They call it over fat for their health. They're buying into a story told by industry. And the industry goes on and continues to, to tell this story that they're going to be saved by industry. Monsanto will save you. Eli Lilly will save you. They're not going to save you. <laughs> they haven't saved you. Look around. 91% of people are sick. So, but we're not. And you, the, the the friends and relatives you know eat a starch based diet. They're not. I mean, there may be some residual from their previous life, or you know, on misfortune. Uh, we do get injured in life, and some of us permanent. Anyway, you have another question, AJ. Yeah, I do actually from Neil, and he wanted to know how you feel about saunas. Are there any benefits to doing one? I. Uh I, Is it I don't cardiovascular know. health asking specifically. I, I, I don't know. Okay. I, I bet if I looked up on the internet, I would find some pretty positive things about saunas. But, you know, we, we've all been told how they cause your body to excrete poisons. Probably do. Probably do. I'm trying to think about some research that, uh, that I've read in the past, but it goes back a long time about how saunas and you know steam baths and hot tubs and so on do do cause the body to release some toxins. Uh, whether that's true or not, I'd have to find out. I'd have to research it. Uh, I certainly have known in my past when I've been sick, like with a flu or something, that a sauna was uh, pleasurable. You know, I went into the sauna with the idea that it was somehow going to cure me. It never seemed to. Oh, I'm sure it feels good at the very least. It does no harm. At least but it's not harmful. It's yeah. the food. It's the food. It depends on part what you bring into the sauna with you. If you bring in a double cheeseburger, then the sauna is not going to help. 
you bring in a great big bowl of beans and rice, and guess what? The sun is going to help. That's funny. Yeah, they have funny. some new kind now. There's something called an infrared sauna that's kind of new that a lot of people. I have. heard about that. I and actually I saw some things where they have these infrared boxes that you can treat your feet and your arms in. And boy, I'll tell you, that's a, I, just just from my general skeptic point of view. I have to say that the public is going to get fooled again. But I could be wrong. I haven't researched it. And uh, but most of these things that I hear about these miracles, if it seems too good to be true, guess what? And people may say that about what I say too. Dan McDougall, if he thinks he can cure all these diseases just by fixing the food, sounds too good to be true. Try it. You suggested, or somebody suggested, three weeks. The program That's has always been sold. As a, yeah, it's always been sold as a twelve-day program. Ladies and gentlemen, you will see the benefit in four days. Four days. You'll be pretty much convinced by seven days and by 12, which is why we run a 12-day program. You'll be solid. You know, we put you through 12 days of intensive support and education through our program, our internet telemedicine program, where we take people from all over the world. we got one coming up here in a week or two. Uh, I think there's a spot or two left in it you can get in, but... You know, we, we spend people with people for 12 days, and by that time they're off. Well, they're off. they've reduced or stopped 90% of their drugs. Their weight has dropped an average of three and a half pounds, or more than that now. They were in 10 days it dropped three and a half pounds. And in and, and 12 days, we get even better weight loss. You've lost about four pounds. You've dropped your cholesterol over 22 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, you've gotten off your medication or reduced your medication in nearly 90% of times. You, you've committed yourself to be compliant to the diet for a year, 85% of the time. That happened to you in 12 days. People who go through the 10 or 12 day program, they've been found to comply with the program after the 10 or 12 days for a year, nearly 85% of the time. Why? Because they like the food and the results are phenomenal. They go, it's too good to be true. Oh, it is true. It really is true. Didn't cost me anything either. Didn't hurt me at all. Gave me a good bowel movement. Introduced me to, to a new way of living. Now I know what a vegan is. Well, I'm not, not just a vegan, folks. You know that. Uh, well, did I answer the question, AJ? I don't even remember what it was anymore, but yes, you did, Dr. Well, let's go on to the next one. <laughs> okay, no problem. Uh, this is from Angela. I am a 45-year-old female that has been following Dr. McDougall's starch-based diet since March of 2020. So a blood donor. I've noticed since I switched my diet that my iron levels take much longer to return to normal between blood donations than before. In fact, I haven't been able to make a power donation because my iron levels do not meet the criteria. Is there something I can do that speed that process? Are iron supplements safe to try? Thank you. Okay, well, first of all, when somebody has an anemia or a low iron, you must look for the source of that problem. It is malpractice to treat somebody with, with anemia or a low iron or low blood count. I mean, something that's significant and worrisome. It's malpractice to not first look for the source of blood loss. You look at for blood loss in the bowels and then the vagina. Otherwise, everything else is obvious. If you're bleeding from a laceration in your neck, you can see it. But you might be miss, you might not, you might miss it if it's in the stool or the vagina. So look for the source first. Second of all, uh, people who follow our program have lower complete blood cell counts. All the blood cells are lower and that's good. Because what it does is it represents better health. In the case of your blood cells, your red blood cells, they carry oxygen through the system. Red blood cells or hemoglobin goes up in smokers, okay? Cigarette smokers. Why? Because, because of the carbon monoxide that's produced by smoking it has to be compensated for by more blood. So when you quit smoking, your hemoglobin goes down because the carbon monoxide is no longer there and you get better, uh, better respiration. 
and better circulation too. Okay, so uh, so when it comes to infection or white blood cell count, we typically see people with lower blood white blood cell counts than what is written as normal, which which means what the average person eating American diet runs. That's what normal is. So because we have less inflammation to deal with from all kinds of sources, we don't need a strong inflammatory response. We don't need high white blood cell count. Now, as far as taking iron goes, pills, well, there's loads of iron in the food, so you don't have to look for any special iron source. Uh, vitamin C, which of course is heavy in fruits and vegetables, encourages iron absorption. So you might include some more vitamin C. Dairy products cause iron deficiency anemia. So if you're on any dairy at all, you need to be off. Okay, the dairy, the calcium in the dairy complex is the, excuse me, the, yeah, the calcium and phosphorus complex iron and make it unabsorbable. And the dairy protein causes bleeding in the gut. You have to get off the dairy. Uh, taking iron supplements. They make you constipated. They turn your stool black. Over the long run, they may increase your risk of heart disease, but not just take for a short period of time. But usually they're not necessary. You just correct it with food. But if you want to take the supplements, I don't think there are any major harm. I would probably prescribe them on occasion if I thought it was the right thing to do. Uh, take the supplements. But you got to go look for, look for the reason for the... The, but, the but low, she, said, uh, she said she's been following your diet for three years and it, she it does isn't the donation is what making it low that could be too that's a good thought jj yeah I mean, if you're giving blood a lot you ended up with a low hemoglobin well you Thank know you. i mean you didn't do enough doctors you know it just it, it came to me so that that's interesting yeah we'll you know that's actually an issue that's actually an issue published in our medical journals recently over the last few months about how all the blood taken during a hospital stay from a patient results in a significant blood loss. So they're starting to take, you know, figure out ways they could just use a little tiny drop of blood to get do the same testing as opposed to a whole tube. And when you're in the hospital, you're often having two or three or four tubes of blood taken a day. You know, so. You can you can become yeah as you mentioned you can become iron deficient and anemic just by giving blood either because you need lab tests or you donate the blood so thanks that was a good thought well but, thank um, you and, and you know just I guess if you talk to doctors enough you start thinking like one because one of the regulars on Chef, the Chef AJ lineup who's one of your biggest fans and was a star McDougaller Dr Peter Rogers feels that having lower iron is better for health, especially for people that maybe have cancer. And so I, I don't know much about that, but he has mentioned that well, it's better to not be high in iron. It is and because iron is an oxidant. So it makes oxidized everything and oxidized, which makes it very reactive, which makes it very damaging to the tissues. Now, one of the reasons that people felt that iron uh, caused more heart disease is because women have lower heart disease rates than men. Women meet, menstruate and have lower blood levels than men. They lose iron every month. And the other is the observation that people who donate blood have lower heart disease risks than people who don't. Well, that could be for two reasons. One, you're getting rid of the extra iron, which is an oxidant. Or two, maybe they come from the same group of people. In other words, it's confounding. People who are conscientious to give blood are probably also, or more likely also to be conscientious of their diet and not cigarette smoking, et cetera. So it just may be a confounding factor. But uh, yeah, I, I agree with him is that uh, higher end levels may be very toxic in terms of oxidation, which leads to cancer and heart disease. Yeah, Are you Tissue interested in, in, in what he wrote to me about it, Dr. McDougall? And, and he... He's there's some Dr. Zaka Ronsky, who's considered the world expert on ferritin, saying it's one of the best predictors of longevity. And that um, he said that cancer needs iron to grow. Serum ferritin is easy to lower quickly with blood donations, more slowly to avoid fortified food, exercise more. The ideal ferritin is 50 to 60. And then, of course, he just talks about um, the ideal food is potatoes and sweet potatoes, a low protein starch. So anyway, I thought that was kind of interesting. 
Well, it, it is. And again, you know, if you, if you, and you may have to tell a little bit of story to get there. But if you, if you start studying this enough, you'll find that it all comes down to it's the food. You know, I, and again, just like our discussion of, of iron deficiency, how do, why do you develop iron deficiency? Well, you have heavy menstrual periods from the Western diet. So you have excessive blood loss. You have all kinds of GI problems that cause blood loss, all the way from hemorrhoids to uh, gastric ulcers, diverticuli, colon cancer, diverticulosis, and they're all due to the diet. So, you know, except for infections and falls, you know, you, and gunshot wounds and bow and arrow shots, auto accidents, et cetera, you can be pretty much immune from 90% of the illnesses that plague our society by getting this message right. It's the food. In the year 2004 and five and six, everybody's going to know this because we're going to go out and spread the good news. We're going to tell them, we're going to show them the truth. The truth can't hide anymore. And neither can the polluters, liars, and cheaters. We're going to get you. Yeah, we are. Nice. Okay, so here's a question from Darlene. I have recently heard of a product called MSM, which is supposed to cure just about anything from cancer to yeah. Lyme disease to autism. I find this hard to believe, a little too good to be true. Do you think this could be hurting desperate people that may have tried everything for their illnesses? I think it's some sort of bleach. Uh, it's, it's another one of the supplements. MSM used to be promoted with uh, St. John's Wharton. And my distant memory is that they both have effects on depression and general body health. Uh, I, th I think the research supports St. John's Ward as far as relieving depression. But again, I'd have to review it carefully. MSM, which is a, an abbreviation for, I don't know, for chemical, a chemical compound. I don't remember what it is. I haven't made much research supporting its benefits. But you don't need these things. You don't need, you could do, just go back to the basics. You get a safe amount of exercise, safe kind of exercise, an adequate amount of sunshine, and you eat the right food. Just, you just be fine. You know, you want to avoid bows and arrows and people who have COVID. You got to do that too. Yeah, we did that. We, uh, you know, anyway. It's been it's it's been an amazing what has it been since 2019. So it's been what, five years since five years since this all started. Uh, because of social distancing, Mary and I have pretty much avoided all illnesses. It works. Social distancing works. Of course, you don't have any friends or relatives that will come and see you anymore, but it works. I'm, I'm sure. Just like we've made the the, uh, the right balance there between being safe and enjoying your friends and family. Yeah, are you? Somebody's asking if you're a fan of the RSV vaccine that some people are getting now. I don't know yet. People keep asking me that, and I want you to keep asking me that. Every article that comes out on RSV, I'm going to read. And when they start showing that people uh, miss work less often, have fewer days of sickness then I'm going to start recommending it. But I haven't seen that yet. And I look. So RSV uh, is is uh, something I'm considering being vaccinated for if it works. But I'm not going to get any more flu vaccines. I started stopped getting those about 30 years ago because they don't work. That's why. Not, not because I'm, I fear vaccines. It's just the problem is they don't work because of... Uh, variants because of genetic shift because what's infectious today is not infectious tomorrow a new virus comes around and they made the vaccine against the old virus and we're seeing the same thing with covid now we got the first two covid shots mary and i did we get more once once things become stable but right now you know every day in the paper you read about a new covid variant which is not affected by the current vaccines. 
So if RSV turns out to be stable, like chickenpox and smallpox and measles and hepatitis, these are vaccines that have a reputation for having a stable virus that we can make a, a, a vaccine against, then I'll take it. I'll recommend it for you. But I don't want you to take something that has side effects and costs and inconvenience and risks if the benefits don't outweigh it. Right now, I can't say that, but hopefully I can. I don't want to get sick. Good grief. I don't want to catch a cold or a flu or COVID or social distancing works. And they say, they say, and there's good evidence that if you eat a good diet, you have much, much less chance of having serious complications from infections all the way from, from RSV to chickenpox to hepatitis to COVID. Uh, people who eat well seem to survive these illnesses, viral illnesses. Well, you'd think so. Your immune system's better. Your body's not busy fighting off all the garbage you just ate for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So yeah, we, we avoid hospitalizations and intubations and death. So the research says you can always you can always do public health measures. Wash your hands, social distances, masks. You could do those. Don't cost you anything. You can always eat a good diet. The drugs so far are of limited value. And of course, they're very political and controversy too, particularly the vaccines. So I, I would rely on the things that cost you nothing that you could do yourself that really do work. Thank you. This is an anonymous question submitted by a 75-year-old active female who's been whole food, plant-based, SOS-free for a year, healthy, mostly vegan, mostly, I don't know what that means, no dairy, for 30 years. Her labs revealed blood glucose of 100 and A1C of 5.7. 95 for the blood glucose and only 5.3 for the A1C. She's eating more Yukon gold potatoes. Any advice? Are those numbers terrible or acceptable? Unless I heard them wrong, a, a glucose of 100 and a, a A1C of 5.7, they're perfect. Yeah, so why, why, why? I guess she's worried that the blood sugar was five more and the A1C was 0.4 more. That... Uh, look, if your blood sugar... Well, by definition, if your blood sugar fasting is below 126, you're not considered diabetic. And your hemoglobin A1C is below six, you're not considered diabetic. But that, that's the rules that uh, my colleagues play by. Now, what I play by is uh, looking at what you're currently at right now and telling you how to fix it. I mean, to fix it so that it, it translates into better health. You can fix the blood sugar in the A1C by giving insulin and various diabetic pills. And we've done that. We did it in six major studies. These studies are the veteran study, the, the trace study, which is the European study, uh, the, the British study, DCCT study. Then we did three studies uh, that were published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2008, the uh, Accord, the Advance, and the second vet veteran study. All six of these studies show that aggressive treatment kills. No question about it, it kills. So if your goal is to make your blood sugar, but in this case, hemoglobin A1C, look normal by drugs, you're gonna increase your risk of dying, heart attacks, sudden death, hypoglycemia, weight gain, that's what happens. That's what the research says when you aggressively treat. So when they when they took the large group of people, they divided them in half, they had one group do standard care, which resulted in a hemoglobin A1C of about 7 to 8%. The other group, they gave them four shots a day, checked their blood sugar sometimes four times a day, took four different kinds of pills a day. They got their hemoglobin A1Cs down to close six, close to 6%. <laughs> But they ended up gaining twice as much weight. They ended up dying. The National Heart and Lung and Blood Institute had to stop the Accord study 17 months early because it was killing so many people, but with aggressive treatment. So, you know, 
So you got to get it right by the food. You got to get off the drugs if you're a type two diabetic and most type one and a half diabetics. Type one diabetics always have to take insulin. Hey, Dr. McDougall on Instagram, somebody commented that you need to be awarded the Nobel Prize for Health. Oh, good. <laughs> or how about That's this, great. Dr. McDougall for Surgeon General? That's a good one. I, I've always wanted to be Surgeon General. I figured I could be appointed and I'd last 24 hours before I was assassinated. And I would I would tell them, I would, I would, anyway. It, it's, would it's, it's dangerous to be outspoken these days. Yeah, you so, get canceled. Yeah, the things that are, are it's been really interesting for me, uh, the current events, because they made me aware, aware of, of things that I took for granted for so long, you know, about how people treat each other and some of the cruelty that people are capable of and some of the kindness people are capable of and how they can buy into a story that they really believe, which is so different from what other people believe. It's just these stories that they're telling. I, I think that's a so way we ought to start looking at things. As people tell themselves a story, these are known as religions or they're known as political positions, and they believe them. They believe these stories and they start acting this way. And a lot of people get hurt and some people get hard, get helped, but it's crazy. Anyway, I want you to all change your story and start believing that you are a healthy person you're good looking, you're fully functional, you've got a normal healthy lifespan ahead of you, but, but you haven't learned the truth about the food. That's the story I want you to tell yourself. And then I, as AJ, she wants she wants to take three weeks. I, I want you to take somewhere between about 10 or 12 days and see who's right. See which story you want to buy, buy into. The one about eating all this rich food and how good it is for you and how you need protein, calcium, and omega-3 fats. Or you want to buy into the story of eat starch? Uh, I know what the results will be. Always. Yep. So here's a disease. Maybe and wants any positive results or experiences with polycythemia vera. Polycythemia vera. As I remember, and I have to look. I don't have my looker upper here, which is Mary. She's. I'll look it anyway, up for you, Doc. Anyway, polycythemia vera is an autoimmune disease that, uh, as I remember, affects the skin and causes all kinds of discoloration. And uh, if it's an autoimmune disease, it's caused by by the the animal proteins you eat. What is it? It says in oncology, it's an uncommon myoproliferative neoplasm, chronic leukemia, in which the bone marrow makes too many red blood cells, as well as white blood cells and platelets. There you go. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah. Blood is thicker. And, and so what is the question? Uh, have you had any good results? Well, will, the, will the diet help? Is that the question? Or just have you had any, have you seen anybody with it that's had good results? I've seen people with polycythemia vera, but it's been, you know, since I've been in general practice, which I stopped doing in 1987. So I probably before 1987, I saw people with polycythemia vera. And, you know, as you as you read, wrote about it, I do remember and being related to cancer. And the question is, should you follow a good diet for this condition? Will it cure it? I don't know. Should you follow a good diet? Absolutely. Absolutely. No matter what happens to you, you ought to follow a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables because that's the human diet. Because there's you no know, other it, diet, it, diet that will cure these other things. It, we get that question all of a sudden, will it help with this? Will it help with this? Even if it doesn't help with that, it's going to help with everything else. So what other diet would you possibly follow? Well, like, for example, if, 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 you, if you cut off your foot, what diet do you follow when you cut off your foot? The same okay, one. if you have a racehorse and a racehorse breaks its leg, do you put it on cat food? You know, there is one diet for you, whether you have tuberculosis, whether you got hit by a car, whether you're uh, entering a beauty contest with uh, a, a, a skimpy bathing suit on or you're a football player, or there is one diet for human beings. So... You know, uh, are there any variations of that diet that make it more effective? Yeah, 
but they're restrictions. They're not additions. And you know, like, for example, uh, when people have liver or kidney disease or osteoporosis or kidney stones, I ask them to eat far less protein, far, far, far less. So they cut back on their beans, peas, and lentils. And maybe they add some simple sugar to reduce the protein further. Uh, there are some, some allergies that people have to certain foods. Don't eat them. You know, if you're allergic to wheat or strawberries or whatever, don't eat it. Again, it's, it's taking things away. There are people with very, very severe kidney disease and heart failure who I have to put on an extremely low salt diet. Again, the diet varies by restrictions, not additions. Uh, people with uh, high triglycerides and heart disease, I may cut down on their fruit and fruit and fruit and juice and other simple sugar intake because the, these simple sugars raise triglycerides, which sludge the blood, which can't make the circulation better. It has to make it worse. So it, the, it it's a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables. And there are some modifications. If you look in the book, The McDougall Plan, which by the way, I think Heather is still giving the books free away free. I don't know if she's got back from her vacation and taking them down yet, but if you hurry up today and you go to our website and you start looking at books that I published, that I have a copyright on, like the McDougall Plan, McDougall's Medicine, A Challenging Second Opinion, the McDougall Program for Women, the McDougall Program for Heart Disease, the McDougall Health Supporting Cookbooks, Volume 1 and 2. They're all free. Give them nice. to 10,000 of your friends and relatives. They're free. You know, put them, give them out for New Year's gifts. They're free. And they really don't need any updating. The other books are cheap, uh, like The Starch Solution and The Healthiest Diet on the Planet and the, uh, the uh, weight loss book. You know, the publishers still own those titles. They've owned them for 30 years. Why? Because they still make money off of them. Why? Because they're big sellers. And I'm glad of that. But half the books we own, and I'm sure the publishers regret giving us the, uh, the copyright back on those books. I have no doubt. Penguin Putnam, which uh, has another name now, Penguin Putnam Dutton Plume, I think it is. You gave me up a few years back. You let me have those books back. Now they're still big sellers called backlists. But I own them. You don't. And Heather gave them away for this Christmas vacation, this holiday. They're the holiday vacations. Thank anyway. You, yeah. Thank you. The truth don't change. So if you read this stuff in these books, you go, oh, he published this in 1984. Look at this. All the references are before 1984. How can that be? Can't be true. Excuse me. That's the most available in 1984. But if you attend 5 o'clock Pacific time, Sunday nights on our YouTube channel, McDougal channel, Mary and I and Heather will be there live. And anytime I feel like it, which happens to be every week, I'll bring you up to date on current publications that tell you that the truth don't change and it was all, all well established before 1984 when it comes to the right diet and proper medical care. And in the meantime, people's egos and their money have gotten in the way of the truth. So you don't hear about it. Here's a question about water and minerals. Heidi, she said she has well water and was advised by a naturopathic doctor to use a reverse osmosis filter for drinking and has been doing so for several years, but recently learned that reverse osmosis filters also eliminates minerals the body needs, such as calcium and magnesium, which could lead to osteoporosis. Should she change her filter or add minerals to her water, or should she even be concerned? Okay, let me tell you where this comes from. And one of the advantages of being around for a half a century and more is that I, I read the original research. Uh, this, this comes from studies of well water. And uh, what they find, of course, about well water has lots of minerals is people who drank from wells had a higher rate of heart disease. This falls back into the discussion we had about iron and how iron is an oxidant, which is damaging to the arteries and tissues and so on, and increases your risk of heart disease at least. 
So, so that's where it comes from is the fact that they saw a, a, a lesser incidence of heart disease in people who drink, drink these high mineral waters. And she's right. Uh, there, there, there's calcium and you know all kinds of minerals uh, that, that come from. You need iron too. They, they come from your drinking water, but you know, in most cases they're pretty small amounts. And uh, as far as putting it through an osmo, osmotic filter and taking every single one of the minerals out, doesn't matter. You get plenty of minerals from the basic food. So. <laughs> Again, I would send you back to chasing the basic food. Uh, most of this is likely a confounding issue is the fact that people drink from wells. I would suppose are mostly farmers. And most of the farmers eat what they grow, cows and pigs and chickens. So I, I think it really goes back to the food. I doubt there are very, very many uh, farmers on starch-based diets. Or, or, <laughs> People drinking even well water and city water on starch-based diets, so it's a pretty fair estimate. Uh, I, I think there's some confounding issues here, even though there's a little bit of truth. It's always a little truth. The question is, are they going to uh, blow that little truth into something that is, uh, in its totality, correct or incorrect, and will result in harm or good to you and your family? But there's always a little truth, and I always look for the truth. And then I look how they spin, spun it to make you believe something that favors usually their products. So they make more money. So that's the way the world works. It works on money. Sad to say. You know that. I'm not telling you anything new. This has nothing to do with... It, it has, we're not isolated from the problem, the field of nutrition and medicine, from, from the human problem of, of, of greed. Yep. All right. Let's see. I saw something in the chat. Somebody's asking if you have, uh, if you wear sunscreen, do you still need to take vitamin D? But you don't want people to take vitamin D anyway, right? No, I don't. Uh, but the sunshine will go through your protective sunscreen filters uh, adequate enough to prevent vitamin D deficiency. You don't need much sunshine. You know, uh, a very white person like myself needs to expose my back of my hands and my face five minutes, three times a week in the spring, fall, and summer at the latitude of Boston. That's it, back of my hands and my face. Five minutes at noon at the latitude of Boston, three times a week. So, you know, you're not going to get vitamin deficient from, unless you go to the extreme. From sunscreen uh, protection, you'll still get enough sunshine in parts that you missed or that have been inadequately filtered due to the strength of the of the sun lotion or the time you put it on. I wouldn't worry about that. No, I don't think you take vitamin D supplements. The reason is, is that they've only been shown to benefit elderly, white, institutionalized women. And you had to give the vitamin D with calcium to see the benefits. All right. So uh, the reason that the calcium inclusion is important is because calcium is an antacid. Tums are calcium carbonate. So when you take calcium, you take in alkaline material, which neutralizes dietary acids, which cause osteoporosis. And that's why you have to put calcium in the vitamin D calcium mixture to see any benefit. The reason that only you only see benefits in elderly white institutionalized women is because the benefit is so tiny that you have to take the most sick people to show any difference in. That's why. So, okay, for whatever reason you decide you're going to take vitamin D supplements, you should not take more than a thousand international units a day. That, that's a general consensus of people who write the science and the recommendations. Maximum a thousand, you know, we're talking about taking 600 or 300. You can buy these. But what you usually find when you go to Amazon or any other supplement seller is the D supplements are 5,000. Five times as great as you should be taking. 
And that results in nutritional balances, which increases your risk of falls and fractures. You'll find supplements of 10,000 international units and even 50,000, which are taken weekly, they say. So don't do that. Don't overdose on vitamin D supplements and most preferably get your, your vitamin D naturally from sunshine. Okay, you don't, you live in, in New York, you wear clothes all day and you work during most of the sunshine hours. What do you do? Take vitamin D? Well, you could, but that's not going to solve all the benefits that sunshine offers you. To provide more of the benefits, but probably not all, you could always get a sun lamp. And then you get some more benefits from the direct sunshine, sun, sun ultraviolet radiation. But I, I have to believe the sun's even better than the sun lamps. Somehow, I believe that. Um, are you familiar with Jordan Peterson, Dr. McDougall? Jordan Peterson. Well, tell me a little bit more about uh, he's a He's a psychologist. And one of the viewers is saying, how do you feel about he, he and his uh, adult daughter, they eat only meat now and they say it cured their, uh, you know. Uh, There's another guy out there, another guy, a carnivore doctor. Well, yeah, he's not even a medical doctor. He's a psychologist who's very well. well this, guy, this guy has a medical degree. Uh, the, the, oh, Dr. Sean Baker? I don't know. I, I didn't pay a lot of attention to him. But uh, he tells, says you should eat everything in an animal from the tail to the nose. But why would they yeah. feel better eating that way? How would they poop? But they're, they're the people that are, he's doing it five years. I, I'm looking it up and swears it cured his depression and rheumatoid arthritis. Well, I hope, I hope not many people buy into his story. But anyway, I don't know. You know, there are lots of recommendations out there. Give them a try. See how you feel about it. See how it works. Establish some definite criteria that you're going to assess at the end of the trial to decide whether it was really worth your time, money, and effort. You know, my promise to you is if you have dietary diseases, like obesity and heart disease and kidney disease and diabetes and, you know, constipation, et cetera, my promise to you is if you do our program, you'll get well. How, how soon? Well, start looking for the benefits in four to seven days. 12 days will have things well established, but it could take a couple of years till we lose all the excess fat. Challenge anybody else to the same thing. Well, you know, you're going to get horribly constipated because there's immediately, immediately eating these carnivore diets because there's no dietary fiber in animal foods. So the balls will change drastically. Uh, the next thing you will notice is that you, uh, probably you'll notice is you have greasy skin. And oily skin because you're eating a higher fat diet. Uh, you'll probably, or your friends will notice that you stink. You smell like the foods you eat. So you smell like dead pigs and cows. But they may be eating dead pigs and cows and be adapted to that smell. So they may not notice it, but I would notice it. You stink. And that's in the, just in the first few days. Eating this kind of diet, you're constipated, you stink, you're greasy. You have to wait a while, you know, a few weeks, a few months, a few years to really see the effects. And we've done scientific studies to show that eating these kinds of foods cause heart disease and diabetes and various common cancers. And that's what major organizations show based upon thousands of research papers and history. You know, this story has been told for thousands of years that eating the king's food will make you fat and sick. And that if you eat the food of the common person, starches, vegetables, and fruits, you will be well. Read the first chapter of Daniel in the Bible. That's 2,600 years ago we've been teaching this. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, even though we've been teaching this for, for tens of thousands of years, and you know, tens of thousands of research papers show that this is wrong, you're going to have somebody come out and tell you that you should eat an animal and that's it from nose to tail. Come on. But you know, it's, it's, it's the nature of our society and of people today. They like to hear about the extreme. They find it entertaining. And when somebody recommends the extreme, you, it is, oh, I don't know. it's just, it's just, I really don't know why people act the way they do, but they're, Hey, look at our politics. Need so, I say more? 
Uh, we have a live viewer on Instagram named Debbie who says her cholesterol went up after adopting a plant-based diet. And her only guess is this because she switched from coffee creamer to coconut-based powder creamer. And how do you feel about statins? She wants to know. Well, so, first of all, uh, switching to a non-dairy creamer is, you know, it's, it's, it's choosing between being shot and hung. So neither one of those would I, would I pick. Uh, cholesterol may go up because of laboratory error. So I would base it on more than one test to decide that you're a failure. So get a few tests, see what the, what the case is. If you eat more simple sugar than you did before, or you know that you should, or the first thing you should cut out is all the simple sugars, even the fruits, because too much simple sugar raises triglycerides, which also raises cholesterol because cholesterol runs around in packages called lipoproteins, which are made of triglycerides, protein, and cholesterol. So when you raise triglycerides, you raise the number of these packages. So in a few people, the cholesterols go up when they change their diet. So why don't you just follow the way we teach the diet? Starch based with fruits and vegetables. Coffee will cause a rise in cholesterol of 10%. Decaf coffee of 11%. So there are a whole bunch of factors involved here and you won't be able to answer it until you do the test. Put it to the test. You know, our test lasts 12 days. We feed people a starch-based diet for 12 days. And, and, and our average drop in cholesterol is, is 22 milligrams per deciliter in 12 days. Maintained for a year. So people stick with the program. Anyway, that's what I would, I would think. Thank you. Steph wants to know if we need to take K2. Well, that's, that's another thing. Yeah. Most, most of that research is either flawed or biased, but it's a new, new supplement for sale and they've got to make a story about it. So no, I don't think you should. K2 is, K, K, vitamin K is made by plants. Only plants, no animal makes K. What, uh, what animals do is they, they convert vitamin K1 into five or six different analogs. And one of them being K2, which is associated with all kinds of organs, including the bones. And as a result, they sell you supplements. Are there tests that support the benefit or the benefit outweighs the harm? No. Just a bunch, bunch, bunch of, bunch of uh, independent findings that have been cherry picked to put together a story that makes you believe you need to be taking supplements. No, you need to be eating eating starch-based diet, which is loaded in vitamin K because vitamin K is made by plants. And you as an animal have the ability to convert vitamin K1 into all the, all the analogs because you're an animal. You don't have to eat animals. You're an animal. You can do the things that other animals do just as well. You're even better than they are. Good grief. Oh, I don't want to say that. That seems like a real, real biased statement. I take that back. I do. So there are a lot of people out there that believe that the animal, the animal kingdom is 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 um, should be more appreciated than the human race. But I, I don't want to get into that argument. Teddy bears are beautiful. Koala bears are even more lovely. I love koala bears. So somebody's saying that her dad's blood numbers are at two point one for prostate. He's eating a plant based diet and also taking meds to lower his numbers. What else can they do? Help? Well, you can do lots of things, but what can he do to cause him more good than harm? Is the question. I mean, that's the question. There, there are lots. There are lots of treatments out there, and there are millions of people that will treat you all the way from the supplement industry to the, the most educated specialist in the medical business. We have treatments, but you, you gotta ask yourself, will they do you more good than harm? Well, eating a good diet never does harm. And not only does it help the prostate and prostate cancer, but it helps all the other parts of the body. So yeah, he needs to follow a starch-based diet strictly, like his life depends on it. Because Dean Ornish's work shows that a starch-based diet lowers PSA levels and also shrinks the size of prostate cancers. You'll find that research if you go to my website, which is drmcdougall.com, you look under hot topics, you look under medical topics, and you look under prostate, you'll find Dean Arish's article. All right? 
you can also do other things. You can do nothing, which is what your dad has been offered, which is called watchful waiting. Well, why, why does the medical profession tell men that you can just observe your prostate and they don't tell women they can observe their breasts when they have cancer? See, breast cancer and prostate cancer are, are analogous. One occurs in men, one occurs in women, but their natural history, their cause, their development, their treatment response, basically the same. But because it's a male-dominated medical business, we give men an extra chance. We tell them they don't have to go into these dangerous, useless, costly treatments. But we don't tell women that. We push them right into these aggressive therapies. Just a side note. Okay, so you can go aggressive. You can do radiation. You can have the prostate removed. You can have, you can have special kinds of radiation with little localized radiation seeds. They'll cut various parts of your prostate up, but never have them been shown to save lives, ever. Or you can give drugs, hormones. And I think the hormone uh, deprivation therapy is going to be a bad value. And androgen male hormone deprivation. Just like in women, uh, female hormone deprivation is of tremendous benefit in terms of survival and uh, recurrence of breast cancer. So you take estrogens away from a woman, and there are various ways to do that. They do better. And I believe if you take androgens away from men, they'll do better. We once tried giving estrogens to men. That was how much the separation between this being a, a female and male disease was. It was, well, of course, females don't get prostate cancer. So we started treating men with estrogen who had prostate cancer. Well, they did worse. <laughs> they ended up having more heart disease. So we don't do that anymore. Yeah, that's how that, that, theory, that theory goes. So I would, a uh, strong diet, maybe consider and androgen deprivation. Talk to your doctor about that. Only do the surgery or radiation for symptom relief. In other words, you can't urinate. Or you had horrible pain someplace. Symptom relief, it's not going to save lives. It's already too late. The cattle are already in the barn. The disease is spread all over the body by the time you find it. Always. If it's a cancer. She said he's on some medication to lower the numbers. Oh, that, they, they, it's, it's an anti-estrogen. Oh, it's anti, anti-testosterone. Anti-androgen. Androgen male hormones. That's what it was. Well, I don't know, remember what one it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does lower PSA. It shrinks prostate too. So prolonged life, questionable. But I would certainly look in that direction. I, I, I look at the basic research. In other words, I encourage you to do it. And if you were my patient, I would do it with you uh, to see whether or not the 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 you know the scale ends up on the side of more benefit than harm. So what you want to do. All these treatments have harm. You know, some of them have benefits, some don't. But you want to pick treatments. Your doctor should be prescribing things that do more good than harm, don't you think? Yep. So I got two questions. I know you're gonna you have to go. So I'm, which there's one about HDL and one about dementia. Which one would you prefer if you only have time for one? Oh, uh, well, I'll answer them both. HDL. Well, this person is worried that her HDL, Jenna, watching on Instagram, is too high at 110 because studies link a higher HDL to dementia and her, her LDL is 99. Uh, should she be worried about the high HDL of 110? Her triglycerides were 44. I don't know. I don't think so. See, I'm trying to think of how you get an HDL that high. If you smoke... That'll raise your HDL because you, your metabolism increases. I, I, I don't know why an HDL would be that high and why it would be associated with dementia. So it's probably a confounding factor and no direct causal relationship, I can't imagine. Yeah. <laughs> you get dementia from various reasons. One of them is related to cholesterol, but it's high cholesterol and that would be high bad cholesterol, LDL and low good cholesterol, HDL. And those are, those are little strokes or big strokes, big strokes and little strokes are a common cause of dementia. Alcoholism is another cause of dementia. 
the primary cause of dementia is Alzheimer's disease. That's 60 to 80% of the cases of dementia are due to Alzheimer's disease, which is due to aluminum poisoning. There's a, a whole lecture that I, I gave on YouTube on Alzheimer's and aluminum. There's a, a news, couple of two newsletters I've done on this, showing you the research. And the story is, is quite extensive. In fact, I've written to two major journals, the New England Journal of Medicine and the Journal of the American Medical Association, and asked them to publish a letter of mine about Alzheimer's. They have these new an, uh, monoclonal antibody therapies uh, for treating Alzheimer's. And they're given with the idea that it's going to slow the progression. These drugs cost $26,000 and $52,000 a year, each uh, different drugs, different cost. Both of them show miserable results. Uh, a couple of the new drugs they've used have shown no benefit at all. And one of the drugs that they used showed only a 27% reduction in progression of the Alzheimer's disease. The drugs, as I told you, cost two, 26 and 52,000 a year. Plus 20% of the people who take these drugs, 20% have serious brain injuries, bleeding, damage to the brain from these drugs, 20%. I, I asked them in these two articles that I, I sent, which neither one of them they accepted for publication. They should have. Why, why don't you do an experiment using deferoxamine? which is an aluminum chelating agent, defroxamine, which has been known, well, before 1980, because they published two studies in 1980 that showed if you use desferoxamine, which cost pennies, has no serious side effects, removes the cause of Alzheimer's, the aluminum. They showed that those who took the defroxamine were twice twice better functioning as those of the placebo group. Their functional level was twice as good. They could only show a 20% reduction using the most powerful drugs. That was the best they could do. You know, they, th those who took the defroxamine did 100% better. Why, why won't they at least test it? I'll tell you why. Because defroxamine costs pennies. It's a generic drug. Nobody has any interest in you buying this. The other drugs are tens of thousands of dollars a year. It's the money. That's a good way to end the show, isn't it? Chef yeah. AJ. All right. Well, Absolutely. Dr. McDougall, thank you so much. We've had probably 800 people total watching today on all four right. platforms. So I appreciate your time so much. I look forward to the first Monday of the month. Hopefully we'll see some of Mary this year as well. Yeah, she, she was actually invited to the show and she just never showed up. Oh. She's, she's always there. To, she's always there to, anyway, she'll, she'll be there next Sunday night, five o'clock Pacific time. I can't 5 wait. Thanks, thank, thank, thank you so much, Dr. McDougall. Okay. And happy have, a, have a good have a good day today, AJ, and of course the best to all of you, and especially Charles and Chef AJ for the upcoming years. You do a great service. Thank thank keep, you so much, Dr. McDougall. I so keep appreciate doing it. it. The world is a better place because of you. Aww. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back in 15 minutes for Mariana Figueres Fernandez. She had cancer at the age of 11, and so did her mother. So at 15, she went vegan. Now at the age of 21, she not only is attending both nutrition dietetics school, but medical school in Spain, and she has already published research in the medical journal. We will be broadcasting starting at 12.15 today, New Year's year's day until midnight we have 11 more guests and 10 more more shows so these will only be live on youtube though we're not multi-streaming the next 12 hours so please hop on over on youtube because that's where we can see your comments etc happy new year everyone thank you so much for watching if you like what you see consider subscribing to youtube and happy healthy and prosperous new year to everyone take care